Now I'm going to introduce our next speaker. His name is Matt Swenson. Matt graduated from BYU with a master's degree in information systems management in 2015. And before joining his startup Rivet as the first engineering hire, he worked at Nuvi and Lucidchart. These are two, two companies that I respect very much. Matt uh, enjoys being involved in the open source community and can be found online at mjswenson, Swenson with an E, dot com. He lives in the greater Salt Lake City area with his wife and two kids. Please join me in welcoming Matt Swenson. All right, thank you. Um, before we get started, I just want to make sure everybody's on the same page. Um, when I say remote development environment, what I mean by that is rather than doing your daily development work on your laptop, you do it, most or all of it, on your uh, laptop connected to some hardware that's running in the cloud. Okay? So with that said, um, I thought it'd be nice to start with some, let me just make sure that's focused there. Some reasons, uh, just for context, on why you might want to do that. Some advantages and also some trade-offs. So, uh, first one we'll talk about is um, uh, just some flexibility with your with your hardware choice. So, not all applications that we build today uh, fit nicely into the 15-inch MacBook Pro with 16 gigs of RAM box, right? So many do, but some don't. You, you might need extra GPUs for. Uh, I don't know, machine learning, or maybe you do some 3D rendering, or you might just have other special hardware needs. And the nice thing about a remote environment is that you can, you can change them up even from time to time, depending on what you're working on. Uh, as an example, just a few weeks ago, I was working on a pretty hefty database migration at Rivet. And um, I wanted to make some database backups at known good points so that it, when I inevitably screwed up the database during my development cycle, I could roll back to, to those good points. Uh, as I was making those backups, uh, my, my disk obviously started to fill up because it's very large. And so with just a couple of clicks, I logged into AWS and added another half terabyte of storage to my machine just to make sure I had what I needed. That's, you obviously can't do that with a, with a laptop. More on the um, employer side, there's some benefits to having all of your intellectual property like source code, user data, um, just kind of in your control on your infrastructure, right? And you can also offer some additional flexibility to your uh, employees since they no longer need to have the top of the line laptop to run the software, run the development stack. Um, one of the hallmark benefits of in-office working is the ability to tap your teammate on your shoulder, on their shoulder, and just you know flip your laptop around and say, "Hey, what do you think of this animation?" or "What do you think of uh, this user experience?" or "How the the flow works through this feature?" Right. And obviously, with the pandemic, we, we lost some of that uh, benefit as we, many of us had to go uh, work from home. But with uh, remote in environments, you get some of that back because you're, you're not co-located physically in the office, but your development machines are co-located. And you can virtually tap your teammate on the shoulder and say, hey, here's a URL to my box. What do you think of this animation or this feature, whatever it is that you're working on, right? Uh, probably one of the biggest advantages that we've noticed at Rivet is uh, just improved network performance. So in a typical um, setup where you're working on your laptop, you are doing all of your Yarn installs, NPM installs, Git checkout, Git pull, all that stuff is, you know, is pretty heavy on the network and it's all going through the internet to your laptop. Um, but when you have a remote environment, you're basically taking that and putting it in the cloud, and you're co-locating your development environment with the rest of the internet, which it turns out makes things go a lot faster. So, uh, and you're just streaming really just a little bit of data from, from your environment down to your laptop, like your terminal session, the text coming out of, the, out of those commands, right? So uh, that's, that's the first thing that people at Rivet have noticed as I set up uh, environments for them, is that, wow, I did this NPM install, it was just so fast, or, you know, get push, super fast, get pulled, super fast. Okay, but um, it's obviously there are no silver bullets, so um, let's talk about some of the trade-offs. Since it's a relatively new trend, the tools um, are still evolving to, pro to provide adequate quit support for a remote setup. Uh, VS Code, which I know is very popular, many of us use it, I use it personally, daily, um, has really strong support with its new suite of remote development extensions. Um, by the way, these slides are all online at mjswenson.com if you want to click into these links. 
Um, but this link is to a Twitter exchange between an engineer that was wanting to use PHP Storm in a remote development context, and he was asking JetBrains, which is the maker of PHP Storm, uh, the best way to do that. And kind of the best answer they had for that engineer was to just use X forwarding or VNC or some other way to basically just stream the UI pixels uh, from the remote server down to his to, down to their machine. And uh, obviously, that's that's not going to be a great experience. So the maturity of the tools is really uh, quite paramount to to how well this, this setup is going to be able to work. Uh, the other, one of the other trade-offs is you have uh, additional complexity. So, uh, you know, developing on a laptop is relatively straightforward, but when you put that in the internet, you've got networking, you've got possibly DNS, uh, you know, uh, records and whatnot. It just adds a little bit of complexity to your setup, for sure. Um, and this is going to be a deal breaker for Kent, uh, riding his one wheel up into the mountains. But obviously, with a remote setup, you can't work offline. Uh, in my opinion, I think that's uh, relatively rare. I don't know how many companies these days are really making sure that they have a strong offline developer experience for their engineers. But it does happen, so that's something to keep in mind. And then, obviously, change is hard. We've been developing a certain way for a long time, and we have tools that have matured and evolved. and and practices and habits, and, and sometimes that's hard to break. But uh, let's dive in now um, into how we might go about setting up a, a good remote development environment setup. So I'm going to actually show a couple of sort of two high-level options. And um, they really represent more of a spectrum. So you can kind of do things along this spectrum. So on one side of the spectrum, you have what I call the hybrid option, which is where you have uh, you still keep a lot of stuff local, like your editor. You have your Git installation. You have your repository checkout. Um, you obviously have your browser. And you have a VPN client, so you can connect to your remote. And you also have some synchronization software, like rsync or unison, uh, to sync your source code files back over to your, to your uh, server. And then on the remote side, obviously, you have that same synchronization software, so they can connect. And then you have your runtime dependencies uh, for your application, like Docker and your build tools and whatnot. Sort of on the other side of that spectrum, and this is what I use personally daily and would recommend uh, for its simplicity and also for unlocking some of these advantages that we just talked about. Uh, but I call it the fully remote option. So the local machine, your laptop, is really quite simple, quite thin. You just have your editor client. So maybe VS Code, if that's what you use, or Terminal, if you like to use Vim. Uh, you have your browser, obviously, and then you have your VPN client, and that's it. And then on your remote is where you do all of your typical things. You have your, your Git uh, installation, your repository, dependencies, uh, SSH keys, PGP keys, all that stuff, and your build tools and everything. Um, so let's talk a little bit about networking. So uh, if your machine is directly accessible through the, through the internet, you're going to be spending a lot of time really thinking about how to keep your development environment secure, uh, like allow listing ports or uh, making sure your data is scrubbed so that if you know it's if it's online, you don't want it you don't want to have your customers' real data on there and all that stuff. And in my in my opinion that's a losing battle. So what I would recommend is you set up a uh, virtual private network in the cloud that's protected by NAT, almost like you would think of your office or your home network. Um, and that uh, yeah that's just gonna allow you that protection like you would have in any other setting. Um, and then what you do is you take your uh, VPN endpoint and you put it on that network. That way you connect with your laptop to that uh, VPN endpoint, and then you can connect to your development machine a as one peer to another quote unquote peer, uh, th thanks to the VPN. Uh, that way you, you don't have to worry about ports. You can open up arbitrary ports, your debugging ports for your editor or your, you know, your database port, so you can connect your favorite GUI to it, and, and you don't have to worry about intruders uh, getting into your machine. So just some more tips and tricks on the VPN. Thank you. Um, I would recommend, highly recommend using a managed VPN service. Uh, it's a critical part of your workflow. You really don't want to spend any time maintaining it. Uh, I would highly recommend setting up split traffic for performance. So that's a little diagram of what that looks like. So really, just the, the traffic that's destined for a particular block of IP addresses goes to the VPN. Everything else goes straight to the internet. And that's uh, pretty important for performance on things, especially like connections that require a peer-to-peer -peer connection, like uh, your video calls and, and whatnot. So 
most of your internet traffic goes to the internet, and just your your development traffic goes to your your uh, remote machine. And then uh, also, you can point a domain name to your private IP address. Usually, when we do DNS records, we think, oh, uh, you know, host name points to a public IP address where that thing is running, but it doesn't have to be a public IP address. Uh, so you can set it up to point to your, your private IP address, and it won't resolve unless you're on the VPN, which is what you want, because you don't want people to be able to get to your machine. But once you connect to the VPN, it's a nice convenience. So uh, the workflow then, once you've got all that set up, is you connect to the VPN, you connect to your, your machine through SSH, and that's pretty much it. So here's my morningly workflow at Rivet. I connect to the VPN, uh, wait for it to do its thing, and then pop open the Workspace Picker and pick Rivet. You'll see uh, in the corner that it's establishing the SSH connection to my, my box. And then from there, it really looks exactly like uh, just a, any other project. I can pop open the terminal. Again, that's a shell that's running on my remote machine. And just start my, uh, start my development servers, and I'm off, off to the races. So it's really quite seamless. OK, let's uh, have just a couple minutes to talk about alternatives. So if you don't want to set all this up yourself, obviously there are some commercial uh, options. There's coder.com, gitpod.com. Obviously, there's probably many others, too, that could be listed here. Um, the big one, though, uh, that I wanted to be sure to touch on, uh, because it's a pretty recent uh, development in our industry, is GitHub just opened up their Codespaces feature. It's out of beta, and it's available uh, for teams on GitHub. So. I um, went ahead and set up, uh, I took one of my GitHub organizations and upgraded it to a team just so I could play with it and show it to you all today. So uh, this is kind of what that looks like. So here's me upgrading uh, to my team, upgrading my organization, and then there's a new code spaces thing on the left. It says, you want to try it out? Please send an email to our team, which I did. I don't think you have to do that anymore, by the way. Uh, sometime later, they gave me access, so I uh, created a new code space. Pick the size of machine that I want and uh, wait for it to kind of open up and create the container that's running in the cloud and connect to it and all that stuff. I'm kind of a sucker for uh, progressive web apps, so I did click that install prompt in the address bar. And so here is VS Code running in a progressive web app, which is pretty cool. I did notice some strange like font rendering bugs, so I said, well, maybe I'll just try and connect it to my, my usual VS Code instance. So I did that installed the extension, which you have to authorize, just clicking a bunch of times, uh, really quite seamless. And then before long, I was connected and executing code in the cloud from my local VS Code remote, uh, my local VS Code instance. So that in this case, running some, um, some unit tests inside of the code space. Uh, so pretty, pretty darn cool, pretty, pretty easy to use. And then you switch back over to the GitHub UI, and you can see all of your code spaces. Um, so I even made some changes in there and went to commit, but realized that I like to sign my commits with PGP, and I didn't really feel comfortable uploading my private key to the code space. So I s did send a tweet to the uh, engineering manager over there at GitHub asking for a recommendation on how, um, how one might go about doing that. I haven't heard anything back, but I am curious to see how they, they uh, solve that problem. So just uh, in playing with that, I realized there's a couple different uh, approaches to the life cycle. So Get, uh, code spaces are very much meant to be ephemeral, throwaway environments. Like you, you make one, you do your work, you create a branch, set up your pull request, and you throw it away. Uh, whereas the one that, that I've been using full time at Rivet is very much a long running environment. It's kind of like putting your laptop in the cloud. You maintain it, you configure it how you want. And uh, I think both approaches are great and, and can, are valid, and really just depends on your team and your workflow and how you want to do it. Uh, well, that's pretty much all I have for you today. Um, if this is interesting to you, we do have a number of, of uh, engineering positions open at Rivet, so scan that code. Uh, if you want to connect with me, uh, I'm MJ Swenson on Twitter, so that's the other code there. Um, thanks so much.